got a lot of phone calls this morning. It's been a hectic morning and uh, it's it's been going a little crazy. A lot of the times these people are asking me, Hector, when are you going to start talking about dog training? And I, and I tell them, I said, listen, you have to know about body language first. You have to know about calming signals. You have to know how to decompress a dog. You have to know all these things. And today it's going to be about how to manage and control your dog in your home and outside. You could have a dog completely well trained. And if you don't manage him well, it's useless. So let's go back to the question I get asked a lot. Hector, how, when are you going to start talking about dog obedience? If I don't teach you body language, forget about obedience. If I don't teach you how to relax a dog, decompress them, or how they relax on their own, how is that going to benefit you when you're training? As a trainer, I have to qualify the method of training that I'm going to use on your dog. And that's going to depend on how your dog, one, handles stress and body language. Those are just a few. Now, the show after this, which would be next week, September 30th, that one's going to be about breed and, and uh, disposition. After that, we can start talking about dog training. Okay? Dog training is easy, people. You're going to see how easy it is. I'm going to make it really simple. Sit, stay, down, come, and heal. So simple. Okay? What I have a hard time teaching people is the body language. Um, Joe from Arizona messaged me over the week and said, Hector, I, I learned I learned something about your show, the body language, and that prevented me, uh, that told me to take my dog to the vet. And sure enough, there was something wrong with this dog. So knowing body language is important. Susan from, um, where's Susan from? Nebraska was telling me that she saw dangerous body language in another dog. And then she, she was going to adopt this dog, so she decided not to. But then she educated on the people who were adopting this dog to watch my show on how to decompress a dog. If you work in the adoption agency or in a rescue group, it is vital that you know how to decompress a dog from the stress. It is vital. Why? So you can avoid any issues. So you can avoid any issues. Okay. So one, a uh, couple things that I want to mention before my show starts. First of all, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for coming in. Uh, it is, it makes me feel really good when I have repeated viewers. Uh, Erica Hendy, thanks for watching. John, Lisa, Tina, Tina Loveless, we messaged about your Rottweiler. We'll get to it. Uh, we'll get to it, Tina. Okay, we'll, we'll work through it. Uh, we got Megan here. Let me see who else. Uh, Tori, hope everything's going good with both your dogs, Tori. I know you had an issue with one of them. Lori, thanks for watching. George Perry, nice to see you here, George. Looking forward to uh, talking to your group again. Really great group. My public speaking is picking up. I got uh, a couple phone calls today about going go into different parts of the country and I'm really motivated to go back and talk. I might even do a little bit of a live show in a few places. I know there's a few really good, really good conferences I'll be going to, uh, really huge conferences I'll be going to. And so many people are, are, are asking me, you know, what does it feel like to be in front of all those people? So I, I might be even do a little bit about 30 second, a minute live show in front of everybody. It, pretty interesting. Or they like to see what my dog does at the end in one of my shows. Uh, Dave Craig, thanks for watching. Janice, thanks for watching. Janice got me hooked on these uh, these darn dogs that she's got, these blue healers. Man, they're tough. But I, I like them anyways. Um, so Shannon, thanks for watching. Lowell Nash, thanks for watching. Uh, and Kathy and Rhonda. So... What I want to talk about first is something that I have a, a huge passion about that a lot of people don't know about, but
Oh my gosh. I still see dogs. Um, I still see dogs that don't have a standard in Michigan. It is important that we set standards in Michigan so all the dogs are on the same page. It is imperative. Okay, so I'm trying to get this petition going. I have 76 signatures. Um, I'm working on 100. So I, I'm asking all my uh, all my viewers for support. So that's enough for that one. That's enough for my uh, for my uh, change.org. I also want to mention something about a author in Michigan that I trained with. I've trained with this author. She just wrote a book called the Central Asian Shepherds. Woo! If you guys never watched or ever worked, saw work a Central Asian Shepherd, you got something coming. Uh, the picture on the right is me and her husband doing bite work with one of her dogs. This dog shook me like a little rag doll. And a little over a 100 pound dog, but he was extremely impressive. Um, I just want to make a special note because they're very, very good breeders here in Michigan. If you want more information, go to my Facebook, uh, my uh, my Facebook, and you'll see where you can order this book. Very knowledgeable in the breed. Uh, it's a Russian breed, very tough breed, but uh, something that a little bit out of my element, to be honest with you. But I want to for sure mention it to my viewers. Now, one of the things I want to talk about today as my topic is how to manage your dog outside and inside, so you don't set your dog up to fail. No. Another important reason is so you don't go into a liability issue, okay? One of the topics that I teach around the country is how not to get attacked by dogs. Now, as a person, let's see here, I almost threw the tape at you, Nicole. <laughs> oh, I get it, Nicole. Uh, D, 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 Goss, thanks for watching. Uh, Renee Peters, thank you again for watching. I'm gonna go back and forth. I have a little bit of technical difficulties this morning because I'm working on a, uh, a stream deck um, and I'm just trying to get the, uh, the nuts and bolts out of it. But like anything that you do new, there's a learning curve and I'm, I'm just, I just have to do it. I just have to do it, make the mistakes and go through it. Um, one of the things I tell people is do something that you're gonna fail at. Do something you're gonna fail at so you can become better at it and you can use your brain. Okay, that's my motivational talk for today. But um, one of the things I teach around the country is how not to get attacked by dogs. Now, it's sad that I have to teach that to the utility companies, to letter carriers, to police. Now, the reason why I teach that is because there's people who don't know how to manage their dogs. In other words, they leave them outside unsupervised. Now, one thing that people don't understand is that they don't understand that people can come on your property without your permission. For example, for example, letter carriers, it's implied that you're giving them consent to come on your property because they have to deliver mail. Are they trespassing? No. Utility workers, same thing. Police, if they're within the scope of their job, police are not trespassing when they come on your property. So if they got a foot chase going on and they're chasing this bad guy and this bad guy goes through your backyard and your dog who's aggressive has to be back there, listen, they're going to have to protect themselves. So it is imperative that we manage our dogs in a way that doesn't hold us in a position of liability. So how do we do that? Well, one of the things I just said is manage your dog, be out there with him if he's got a potential to maybe bite somebody, okay? So very, very important. I hope that helps. I got a few videos that that's gonna help. Uh, just hear music, Leslie says. Um, I got the speaker going, Leslie. The microphone going, so it should be working. It might be at your end. Uh, the background music is playing. I'll lower it a little bit just to make sure. Because I know I'm talking loud. Uh, Mahoney, Susan, thank you for watching. Lori Mahoney, thanks for watching. I appreciate. Um, so anyways, throughout the week, I'm getting a tremendous amount of messages. And I really appreciate the feedback, you guys. I, I, I can go on and on about the people around the country who watch my replay. Uh, my last video on how to decompress a dog, it was replayed over 1,700 times, which is great. And it's actually targeting the people that I wanted to target. Trainers, rescue groups. 
ad adoption agencies, animal shelters. It's actually targeting exactly the people that I want. So that makes me feel even better. Makes me feel even better. Uh, uh, okay. So, hey, Janela, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Hey, Amanda, thanks again. So let's talk about how to be responsible owners. Now, again, you could have a trained, completely trained dog. And set them up to fail. So what good it is, how what what good it the training is if you're gonna set them up to fail? It's no good. Your training's no good if you can't answer the door. The training's no good if you don't know what to do if your dog's outside and somebody comes on your property. Okay? The training's no good if your dog's so aggressive you can't call him back. Even in a threat situation, okay? Very, very important. So Let's talk about how prevent legal issues. One of them is just supervise your dog when you're outside. If your dog has a propensity to be aggressive, that's even more reason why you should be outside, either playing with them or just watching them. Once you're done, bring them back in. The underground fence containment isn't designed as a dog babysitter. Now, there's many times throughout the year, people will call me and say, Hector, my dog's missing. I have no idea where he's at. What do I do? Can your dog track another dog? That's one of the things. I'm not laughing because of the way they say it. I'm laughing because it's an uncomfortable laugh because I really want to tell them, listen, you can't leave him unsupervised because coyotes can come on your property without your permission. You had a little Pomeranian and that's what happened. A coyote went in her property, took her dog and left. So it's very important that we know how to manage these dogs for legal issues, safety issues at the same time, okay? That's one of the things. You remember, there's people that can come on your property without your permission. Utility workers, letter carriers, police, you know, all, all if they have a job to do, it's called implied consent, implied invitation. So it's very important that we know that, okay? Janice, Nicole, your video up delayed. It will clear up soon. Uh, it might take some time, you're right. Uh, Janice, to catch up. You're right. The um, Michelle Sander, thanks for watching. All right. Uh, cover the windows with window film like we talked about last time, people. You want these dogs to stop looking out the window. You got to do that. These dogs develop so much aggression looking out the window. They become territorial inside and you set them up to fail outside. Hector, my dog's very aggressive. And it's never, what happens is that dogs see other dogs in their property and they bark and go crazy. And I don't want them to look at other dogs and think they chased them away. I don't want them to see other dogs and think that they're aggressive. So put that window in the window covering so you can avoid that. It's a lot of dog aggression. The dogs don't even have to make contact with another dog. They can just become aggressive. Jasmine, hello. You got a new last name, Jasmine. <laughs> Anyways, very, very important, you guys. Cover those windows. That's going to stop a lot of the indoor territorial. Indoor territorial. Now, another way you can, you can manage your dog indoors is only play with them outside. Play with them outside and let them rest inside. However, if they're looking out the window, they're not resting. They're not resting. Okay? So, again, for the ones just coming in, this topic is how to manage your dog indoors and outdoors with a special note on how, what to do if a dog attacks your dog and you're out for a walk, okay? During my introduction, somebody asked me that, so I thought I'd throw it in right now, all right? Thanks for watching, Scott and Danielle. Appreciate it. So, very important to go back on what I was saying. Very important. Have the dog a off switch. In the house, my dogs chew their bone and rest. That's it. Now, if they want to start playing in the house, I, I stop it. I stop the playing right there. No more playing. Okay? They don't play. Now, because of that, I make time to go outside with them and play with a ball. Though I don't let them play together. I play with a ball with them, and then they come back in and rest. That gives them an off and on switch. Okay? And that is imperative to give them an off and on switch. Okay? That way, they don't remain on... What alert status, hypersensitive, hyper alert, and develop PTSD. You want to give them that office. Come on, you guys. It's the same way with us, right? We go to work, we want to come home and decompress. 
And we want to find a hobby that takes us away from our job so our brain shuts off and does something else. I hope we're doing that, right? As, as human beings, we need an off switch. We don't want to be on job all the time, okay? We don't want to be on the job all the time. We want to have what I call, what I call an outlet in reference to find an outlet that complements your brain, a hobby, so you can carry that over into retirement, okay? For the dog, you want an on and off switch. Extremely important. Your dog doesn't have to be loose in the house all the time. A lot of people think their dog has to be loose in the house all the time. Listen, right now, one of my dogs is in a crate in the basement. The other two are outside. I don't want to deal with them right now. So this is how I manage them. Last night, I was working on a project. All three of them downstairs in the basement. I don't want them right up me. I, I need to focus on my job. My, my, my world does not revolve around my dogs. And as much as I love dogs, I also have a job to do at the same time. For people, for, for people who have kids, one of the questions they, think, they say is, it's, it, I don't think, I feel guilty when my dog's in the crate and, and I'm home. Why? You have kids. Those are your number one priority. Then play with your dog, with your kids if you want. If you feel guilty, then take a minute, go outside, play with the dog, come back in and let him rest in the crate. There's nothing wrong with that. All, all the time, his whole life? No, just until he's mature enough so he can be around the kids and be around you managed. As a matter of fact, if you don't manage him, you're gonna run into a problem. What kind of problem are you gonna run into? You're gonna run into a problem where a dog becomes destructive because you're not able to watch him in the house. So just crate them in the house and focus on the kids. Very, very important. When time circumstances permit, get your dog out, take him out and play with him and bring him back in. Then he's resting. You want that on and off switch anyways. And you know how hard it is to control some of these kids. You can control a dog a lot better than some of these kids. And you know that as well as I do. You can tell a kid, don't pull his hair. Don't put your finger in his eyes. Don't put your finger in his ears. And no matter what, they're still going to do it. So it's, it's wise to put the dog away while the kids are in that state of mind too, okay? So that's how you manage them in the house. Thanks for watching, Ken. Steve, Ed, Ed Diaz, thanks for watching. Sarah, thanks for watching. Sarah, I, I'm not sure if you got another dog or not, if I seen it on Facebook or not. I think you did. I think it was you. But if it is, um, go, to my, go to my website. There's some flyers on puppies, puppy training and so on. Okay, it'll help you. Rebecca, thanks for watching. Uh, Patty, uh, you're wonderful. So much great knowledge. You have taught me so much. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, Patty. Um, like I tell everybody, I, I, I know a lot. I don't know everything. I learn something every, every year. Every year I learn something. Um, and a lot of the times, as funny as this sounds, is I learn most of my stuff from people who don't know anything about dogs. Now, why is that? Because their mind is very pure. Their mind is, their mind is pure to the point where they're not, it's not clouded by books. It's not clouded by videos. It's not clouded by other methods. So I learn a lot from people who don't know anything about dogs. Uh, let's see who I got here. Okay, so your dog, manage them in the house. We talked about covering the windows. We talked about not leaving them out unsupervised. Why not unsupervised? Because there's people who can come on your property and there's coyotes or in certain parts of the country, uh, there's certain parts of the country, wolves that can come get your dogs. Okay. They don't have that, that shot collar. All right. Remember that. Um, decompress your dog to manage them. So a destructive behavior doesn't occur. Very important to decompress them. How do you decompress them? The massaging that we talked about last week and also finding an outlet that complements its instinct. Finding an outlet that complements his instinct um, mentally, mentally decompresses him. The massage physically decompresses him. Okay. The perfect dog. Don't we need the same thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. What does obedience do? It teaches him right or wrong. Obedience teaches him right or wrong, which are morals, which are morals for us. Okay. So, uh, any questions so far on anybody's dog? Can't wait for an upcoming session. Yes, Danielle, I hope to meet your expectations. A lot of the times, it's off-leash obedience. It's off-leash obedience. No, no collar, no leash, no nothing. Just your voice and your dog coming to you. 
there is certain times um, where you use a shot collar, very rare. But remember, people, the number one message I got this week, Hector, do you believe in shot collars from trainers? And I say, yes, however, so I qualify it. I qualify it with what type of dog are you using it on? Then I qualify it with how was the dog's body language? Just because it's trained doesn't mean it's happy. I can tell you that right now. So there's there's a girl on that I was watching her train train the dog. Shot collar. The dog was doing everything perfect. It looked sharp. But mouth was closed, body tight. Never in that 30 minutes that she was training with that dog, not one time did the dog open his mouth. Not one time. So what does that tell you? That tells you the dog was internalizing stress. It looks good now, but have fun in about a year from now, or even less than that, depending on how the dog handles stress, okay? So very important. So let's talk about play. Again, this is how to manage your dog. It is so important that you allow them to play with an object, okay? An object that complements their instinct, okay? On the ground, if it's a predator, in the air, if it's a retriever. That way you complement the dog's instinct. It is imperative that they know that, okay? Um, in, the, uh, in the house, no play. Outside, play, okay? Very important that they have that on and off switch. Now, let's talk about in the house. In the house, what I do is I have a tagline on the dog. So this is just a small little cord probably two to three inches that I keep on a dog if I have to grab the dog when I answer the door. So I go to answer the door, I grab the tagline, and I teach the dog, I teach the dog, this is what's expected of you when somebody comes to the door. I want you to sit. I want you to lay down. I want you to stay under control. This is what I do to manage the dog and teach the dog what's expected of it, okay? I don't do the mat thing. I don't tell my dog to go to the mat. I want my dog with me, okay? Now, the reason why I want my dog with me is because most of the dogs that I deal with are dogs who are also used as a psychological deterrent, okay? If they're used as a psychological deterrent, why in the hell am I going to put my dog on a mat when I want him with me? I want him right there with me. I want to project confidence, okay? I want to feel good, I want to look good, and I want to sound good from somebody that I don't know when I answer the door, okay? Extremely important, and I want to project that with my dog at the same time, okay? So I put a tagline on my dog, and I grab him, and I make him sit, and just calm him down. I'm also teaching my dog not to go crazy when somebody's at the door. Okay, so that's a tagline. Just a small little cord that you put on a dog. So you got something to grab. All right. Extremely, extremely important. Now, I also want to talk about, I'm going to turn off my background music here because I want to show you what a dog, if you don't, if you don't, uh, let's see here, look at the video here. Manage your dog outside. Here's a video of a dog that's just loose, just loose out there. And remember, the mailman can be out there and he's got a duty to protect himself. I don't know. So there's a mailman was out there. He's got a duty to protect himself. You got to be able to manage your dog when you're out there. Don't just leave him out unsupervised. Extremely important. Alicia Reagan, thanks for watching. Thanks for the referral, uh, Alicia. I did get a hold of him. We did make some contact. I am helping him out. Okay. Uh, Jacqueline, thanks for watching. Vicki Kane, thanks for watching. So very important, you guys, that we manage our dogs, that we manage our dogs. Uh, let me show you another, um, another, well, I thought I had another video. That's okay. Let me, uh, let me go into, um, Reach the level of off-leash obedience that is going to control your dog to the point where you can call him back if you need to. For example, in my uh, 
I, I've written four books. I'm re-editing my first book right now. This weekend, I'm dedicating my whole weekend to just editing my book. It's about 90% done, but I keep getting different tasks to do uh, and phone calls. Uh, now with my new uh, uh, petition going, I get phone calls from other departments around the country. Hell's that one, huh? What do you mean standards, Hector? We don't have standards. So I'm getting a lot, a lot of feedback in different facets of my life. But this weekend, I'm going to dedicate my book on, uh, on obedience to, to actually get something done with that. About 90% done. But one of the things I want to make sure, you guys, is you have to. You have to be able to stay in the side of caution when you're doing that off-leash obedience. you got to make sure you get that recall. You got to, if you have a dog who's, who is protection trained or is just a good watchdog, in order to manage him correctly, you got to make sure he comes back to you. All right. So here's why. Let's say, let's say you're in the house and somebody starts to come in and your dog's barking, going crazy. You run upstairs or run somewhere to secure yourself with a phone, correct? You want your dog with you, don't you? I know I want my dog with me. So I want to be able to call my dog to me and grab him or her. Now my protection's with me. If I don't have that level of control, my dog is of no use to me, especially if somebody really tries to come in. So this is why it's important to have that ultimate control. You don't have time to put the shot collar on. You don't have time to even hit the button. You got to have that verbal control right there outside. Same thing. You're outside with your dog, you're playing in the underground fence and a loose dog starts to come in your property. You want to be able to have that level of control to call your dog to you and secure them so you can protect your dog. Okay, very, very important. So this is why it's important to gain that complete off leash obedience. So you have that. So you're able to manage the dog and control them, even in the face of aggression towards another dog or aggression towards another person even, okay? And you want to be able to tell them to be quiet. Why do you want to tell them to be quiet? Because if you're on the phone talking to police, they're not going to understand or hear anything you say if this dog is barking the whole time. So the dog's no good to you. The dog is no good to you at that point. As a matter of fact, the dog is even worse because now he's preventing, preventing police to get there to help you, okay? So you got to teach your dog to be quiet. That's managing and controlling your dog. You got to have that off leash obedience. Okay. Very important. Vicky Kane. Thanks for watching. Tina, my dog will take off out the door and run through the neighborhood. Tina, that's a safety issue, isn't it? Not only is that a safety issue for your dog, your dog can get hit by a car. Your dog can get stolen. Your dog can evolve and be aggressive and bite somebody. Okay, so it is important, Tina, that you gain that level of off-leash control, impulse control at the door, impulse control, obedience, tagline. Um, if you have kids, really good tip since Tina mentioned that, um, if you have kids, what happens is that they sometimes they open a door without you there. So what I tell parents, I tell them to put a lock way high on top of the door. That way they can't get to it. Okay. That way they need your help to get to it. It's up really high. And then that way you got, you can manage the, the, uh, the door a little bit better. That's if you have kids, which I'm going to infer, uh, Tina, that, that might be what happened. The kids open a door and the dog's gone. Um, get hit by a car. It can get injured. It can get in a dog fight. And in, in, in one case, a police officer shot a dog because he was out there and the dog came at him. You know, the dog's doing what his job is, protecting his house, protecting his property. But it, it's, it's kind of a double edged sword with police. OK, I teach police how not to shoot dogs or options to not shoot dogs. But I have to teach the homeowner how to control their dog at the door. OK, let me give you an example of that right now. Let me give you an example of the dog like that. So here's a police officer at the door knocking. And the homeowner opens the door. She's got two dogs. She can't control or manage either one. One gets loose, goes after the officer. The officer has a duty to protect himself. He shoots the dog. Okay. He's got a duty to protect himself. 
and we have a duty to manage our dogs at the same time. It's a, it's a, it's a teamwork effort. And regardless of, you can teach an officer all day long what not to do, but if you can't manage your dog at the door like that, have fun, people. What do you expect the officer to do? Get bit first, then shoot the dog? And uh, do you realize that a bite could ruin an officer's career? How can he ruin an officer's career? They, it has. If they bite the hand, their shooting hand, hard enough, they're not going to be able to what? Perform their duties. And that's happened before. That's happened before. So we have a duty to manage and control our dogs at the door in our property. Now, granted, I, I get I get it. We also have to teach officers how to differentiate between a friendly dog, a dangerous dog. And that's my job if they listen. But that's what I need to do or options before they shoot a dog. OK, however, some dogs can leave such amount. They, they cause a lot of damage in such a short amount of time. So they're a little bit more hypersensitive compared to a small dog. All right. So our job is to manage and control the dog. And their job is to differentiate between a friendly dog and a dangerous dog. OK, any police department that, that you think needs training, have them get a hold of me. OK, it's imperative. Here's what I teach. I teach them options and I don't have a dog tied up. I have real videos of dogs attacking me and I can show them what to do. OK, I have real videos of dogs attacking me and I can show them what to do. All right. So it's very important that officers know what to do and homeowners and homeowners know what to do. I hope that makes sense, people. I hope that really makes sense. For some of you guys, I really, I really do. Uh, Wendy, thanks for watching. Uh, Tina, oh yeah, that's a definitely yike. Jamie Curtis, thank you. Uh, Mike Devlin, thanks for watching. Mike got me teaching uh, obedience classes in uh, 2000 for Meridian Township. Uh, he got me started the obedience. Mike Devlin was a high school friend of mine. Um, and uh, and I just wanted to mention that to you. Chad and Stacy, thanks for watching. Uh, let me see who else is watching here. Uh, Victoria, Hector. What do you think of puzzles and mental simulation dog toys for dogs? Very good question, uh, Victoria. Very good question. All right. Let me try to say this as tactful as I can, Victoria. They're useless. I'm being honest with you. Here's why. They don't complement the dog's instincts. Okay? They don't complement the dog's instincts. You have to find something that complements your dog's instincts. Puzzles are not, that for us it's good, but not for a dog. Dogs don't think the way we do, okay? Now, you have huskies who are problem solvers. You have some dogs who are border collies, extremely well problem solvers. But even then, they lead with instincts. We lead with emotions. Dogs lead with instinct. So, for dogs, instead of a puzzle, you could go run a track and a dog would love it. You could go, you could throw something and have them find it in the weeds. That's a puzzle. But not something that they move their nose. All they're doing is moving and, and finding something to eat. It doesn't stimulate them mentally. Okay? It doesn't. It makes you happy that you're doing something. But in, in my eyes, Victoria, I don't, I, I find a game that complements a dog's instincts because dogs lead with instinct. Okay? Let me look for uh, any, uh, any more questions that I have here. Uh, thanks for your honesty. I, believe me, uh, Victoria, I, I, I don't want you to waste your time, which is more valuable than money. I don't want you to waste your time or your money on games that are not going to help your dog. Okay. We lead with emotions. Dogs lead with instincts. They don't have a moral compass. We do. We need to teach them morals. Okay. So very, very important. Emily, thanks for watching. Any more questions? Let me know. I'm going to have about 10, about 10 minutes for questions and for questions. So if you have any questions, let me know, you guys. I got a few, few more things to cover. And I, I gave myself a little bit of time because my last four shows, I haven't been doing that. And again, the, uh, the blowback from uh, my other four shows is like, Hector, can you at least give me, give us five or 10 minutes to ask some questions? And I think that's fair. Um, I, I really like constructive criticism. You guys, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you tell me that I'm doing something uh, wrong or that I should do something different. Um, as a matter of fact, I encourage people to tell me that. 
Um, I, I don't call those, I don't call it constructive, I call it improving. And one of the things that they want me to improve is, have to give me five minutes, 10 minutes for questions. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, when are you coming back to Missouri, uh, Jamie? Jamie, I'm scheduled to go to Missouri uh, twice next month. Um, I'm not exactly sure where you were, but I, I'm scheduled to go twice next month. One of them I can't talk about because um, it's a, a non-disclosure uh, contract, but the other one is a co-op, okay? The other one is a co-op. Sometimes when I go around the country, um, they don't want me to um, advertise or even write down on my Facebook where I'm at. And there's good reasons for that, you guys. There, there is some good reasons for that. Um, maybe a lawsuit, maybe a, a police department uh, has something ongoing, so they don't want to mention that. So just, but I will be going there twice, uh, Jamie. Uh, let's see. I want to, I want to pet your head. Oh, Patty. Oh my goodness, Patty. Here, I'll do it for you, Patty. <laughs> all right. So train both kids and dogs. All right. Now, a lot of trainers who don't have kids don't understand that it's very hard. I mean, it's very hard to have kids with dogs sometimes. Okay. It is not easy. You got to be on top of the dog and it's even worse. You got to be on top of the kids. Now, you don't want to be on top of the kids so much that you take away their independence, that you take away their 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 day. I mean, it's it's too hectic for them. They, they want to be free. So this is why I say manage the dog. Put it away if it's too much. If the dog is chasing the kids and wants to bite the kids while the kids are running around, put the dog away. Put the dog away. Go outside when time permits and play with the dog. Get them tired, bring them back in. It doesn't have to be out there. Uh, Janice, having a hard time finding herding classes for beginners. Might you have links to help connect folks with this? Herding classes, um, you mean for like people who uh, rent their sheep? Is that what you mean, Janice? There is, there is um, I, I need to look. There is a farm who actually allows, allows uh, people to use their sheep for herding. Uh, and I think that's very good. You can even go to, uh, I know one person uh, would go to Potter's Park in Lansing and take their herding dog in there and push all the ducks into the water. Um, although they, they almost got in trouble uh, for animal cruelty, which I'm like, come on, really? They're just hurting the dogs. They're not, I mean, hurting the, the, the duck and the swan and the geese. Um, and that was it. But it was enough to appease the dog mentally that the dog rested the whole night. It, it felt good. It had a job. Uh, Charlie Williams, uh, I have a scent hound that I don't trust off leash when outside. Inside, great recall. Okay, what do I recommend? Let me uh, finish this. A collar. Uh, uh, yes, yes, Charlie. In in that case, their instincts are so damn good that you need a shot collar to get them off mentally. Now remember, it can be used situational, so only when you're outside. But Remember to decompress them after you used it just to stay in the side of air so you don't have destructive behavior. There's nothing wrong with using a shot collar as long as you decompress them and you, you know uh, situationally that you're going to use it. I don't like it when people use them long term, okay, like all day in the house and outside. You notice the dog's body language, his mouth is closed all the time. What kind of life is that? That's crazy. Um, all right, let me uh, go into here. I have a two and a half year old, six month Rottweiler puppy that can be very difficult. They love each other. Oh, this is two dogs, right? Yes. So Megan, what I want you to do um, is go to my flyer on how to, how to raise two puppies at the same time. That flyer will give you some tips on how to bring these two together. Now, with those two dogs, you got to stop them from playing with each other. You got to give them an outlet, each of them an outlet. OK, you don't want them growing up playing together to relieve stress as they get older. They think relieving stress is play and then it turns into aggression. Um, I think they call it uh, sibling syndrome, which all they have to do to take that sibling syndrome away is find an outlet for each of them. OK, so they play with an object, not with each other. I feel guilty when I put him in his crate when my son is snacking or running around. Well, don't feel guilty because if I would feel guilty if you left him out, Megan, and he kept biting the, your dog, uh, he kept going after your son's food. Manage him until you come and see me or until you do off leash. So he's got to learn the word no or leave it. 
A lot of trainers will tell you, don't ever tell your dog no. What the hell? How are you going to teach him morals? How are you going to teach him right or wrong? A lot of trainers will tell you, don't crate your dog. How are you going to manage and control him? You want the first time to be in the crate at the vet or at the groomers? No. Then they become traumatized. We have to we have to expose them. We have to raise them and educate them and understand them that being in a crate is not abandonment. It's somewhere that you're managed and under control. I hope that helps, Megan. Go to my Facebook if you have any questions. Uh, Kelly Joe, thanks for watching. Uh, Mike Devlin, good job, Hector. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Judy, Ravy needs a refresher. I love I, I love you, Judy. Uh, Judith, great great person, Judith. Um, my next refresher, I have to. I have to go back, uh, Judith, and uh, schedule in October. I haven't done that yet. Son and puppy. Uh, no, just the puppy, Megan. Your son can stay out. The puppy needs to be managed. Now, when the dog, when, when you get a chance and, and we train that puppy, um, right or wrong, and we, te we teach him a little self-control, then you can leave him out. Then you can leave him out to manage him better, okay? Uh, Lisa, thanks for watching. I, I appreciate your feedback, Lisa. It helped me quite a bit. Uh, Victoria, what do you think about dog parts? Dangerous, good? Uh, Victoria, here's another one. you got to be careful with dog parts. A lot of people don't know their own dog. Um, you could be setting your dog up to fail. So, so be careful. You could go to a dog park and then at an aggressive dog be there. Now, and if an aggressive dog's there, what about your dog? Do, you, do they know how to stop their dog from attacking your dog? Oh, they don't? So they're just going to watch a dog fight. That's not nice. So if you go to the dog park, Meridian Township is going to open one. And my my understanding from, from Mike Devlin is that they, they split the size of the dogs up, which is outstanding. Many people don't do that. So you go to a dog park that can manage them. That's what they're doing with size. That's even better. But, but. Don't allow dog playing as a form of an outlet to release their stress. You're going to be in trouble when the dog gets older. Okay. Make sure that you find an outlet that complements their instinct, frisbee or ball. Okay. Very important. Dog parts. Okay. Just don't use that as your main source of relieving stress. A good question to ask me, Victoria, for outlet, for your, for an outlet for managing your dog. Any quick Tips for dog aggression. Dog to dog aggression. The easiest tip that I can give you is find an outlet so your dog attacks the outlet instead of another dog. That's number one issue. Then off leash training. Find an outlet, then off leash training. Many, many times people will come to me and say, Hector, my dog won't chase a ball. And he's three or four years old. I'm like, you know what? You have one hell of a job. Your job is to get this dog to find an outlet. How is he going to feel like a dog if he doesn't chase a ball or a frisbee? How does one feel like a dog? How do we feel? How do we feel when we don't find something that we love? Or how do we how do we feel when we're lonely? We don't feel good because we lead with emotions. Dogs lead with instinct. The absence of love creates a dysfunction in our brain. The absence of instinct does the same thing to a dog. I hope that helps. So your dog aggression issue, find an outlet first, then worry about dog aggression later. Dogs don't need to play with other dogs. They need to play with an instinct, okay? L real quick, let me go into the last topic before I answer more questions. And I might go over a little bit because I got a lot of questions here. Let me talk about what to do if a dog attacks your dog while you're out for a walk, okay? What I want you to do is I want you to do... A leash windmill. Now, if you look at the leash, Melissa is here making a fast windmill in front of her dog. Her dog is getting acclimated too. So if a dog approaches her, the dog gets hit with the, with the leash. If you have a walking stick, you swing it back and forth. You're covering a 180 degree angle. Look how it looks. If, if she strikes the dog, how's that going to look? If she comes down on the dog, doesn't that look like she's she's using a weapon? I know it does look on me. So what you want to do is make a leash windmill 
That was her first time doing it. So she did pretty good. Her uh, Melissa Johnson did a real good job. Leash one meal really fast. And then also you can have a cane go back and forth, back and forth, cover 180 degree. Now, I know I'm going to get some egotistical guys that are going to say, I'll just shoot the dog or I'll just kick him. I know I'm going to get because I get them all the time when I do my talks. Here's what I say to them. If that is your first option, have fun if somebody got you on video. Have fun if somebody gets you on video and they put you in the news and have fun if this dog got out for unforeseen circumstances. OK, not all dogs are going to go out and the owners are just like, I'll let them out. Let's go attack somebody. All right. So you want to you want to try you want to try a few things first to protect you and the dog before you go to lethal force. Um, it, it's so important, you guys. So leash one meal and the walking stick back and forth. I'm not saying that lethal force isn't an option, but you also have to remember two things. You gotta remember two things. You're being watched and the homeowner. You can be focused on the dog and some homeowners may protect their dog just because it's a family member and then you got shots fired at you too. So try to use the leash and the walking stick before you use anything else. I hope that helped. I wanna thank Melissa for your help with that, with that video. Um, so any, I hope, let me make sure I cover everything on my talk today before I go into my questions and answers. So, uh, be responsible owner, control them at the door, tagline, leash, cover the window so they don't develop any stress. If they're outside, manage them, control them. Very, very important. Play with them with that compliments their instinct. If they're around the kids, manage them, put them away in the house if you have to. But because it's a dog, dedicate some time, dedicate some time to uh, to play with the dog. Extremely important. All right. Now, let me go into some questions here. Let me go into some questions here. Uh, Brandy, are tethered or tug, tugs of war to hang from trees useful? Good question, Brandy. My answer is yes. I like tug of war. It releases the dog's tension around the neck. It releases the dog tension around the jaws and head, and it also appeases the dog instinct. It becomes a punching bag for the dog. Very important for it to be a, have a punching bag. The only time I don't allow a dog to play tug of war is if the dog is dominant, dominant, or you're having uh, issues with dogs biting. Okay, those are the only times. But aside from that, tug of war is great. I play tug of war almost daily with my puppy. He cleans his teeth at the same time. Okay. Good question. Uh, Kimberly. Oh, she's watching me. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Katie, thanks for watching. Chelsea. Uh, let's see what you got here. Well, you wrote a little paragraph, Chelsea. My five-month-old, three-year-old Aussie seems like they're always trying to fight for alpha spot. Don't let them fight, uh, Chelsea. Have them play with an outlet. Have them play with a ball. Each of them has a ball. You're right. They're going to they're gonna grow up and they're going to relieve their stress through fighting. Very good. Tails are aroused. Yes, you got to get them to play with an object, such as bear and teeth. Yes, you might have one on a leash and one playing, and then switch over to your husband holding one while you play with the other. Okay, you can do. You can try that. Um, go back to my flyer, Chelsea. How to raise two dogs at the same time? That helps a lot. Uh, let's see here, Megan. To clarify, I have a two and a half old son and a six month old puppy. I wouldn't put my son in the crate. You're right. Put your dog in the crate, not your son. Uh, all right. Sometimes my uh, I'm, I'm reading fast and I'm trying to think a little bit at the same time. Thanks for clarifying that. I appreciate that, Megan. Uh, my, my husband and I are excited to join class. I'm going to make class very fun for you. I love I love class. I love having a good time. I only allow five to six people, but I want to make that class memorable. And, and I want you to remember the class and I want the dog to remember the class. Very, very important. Uh, Carla, Carla, thanks for watching. Julie Pratt, thank you. Uh, Charlie, will, will you repeat what you're saying about scent hounds? My screen locked up. Um, Charlie, scent hounds. What I want you to do, Charlie, go back to my replay and watch it again and, and, and go from there, okay? Time and circumstance is done for me because I had a long little uh, spiel about it. So my replay will be up as soon as this is over. My replay will come on, Charlie. Uh, Sabrina Carpenter, thanks for watching. Kimberly, uh, Bella lunged for one of my child's family members. 
She's a King Corso. Kimberly, that's that's a safety issue. Now, we have to ascertain, did she lunge because of aggression? Did she lunge because of play? Um, you don't want to automatically assume bad, You, but it's a King Corso. So you want to you wanna stay in the side of air. You probably need to see me or send me a video. Um, send me a video of the dog, but don't set your kids up to fail. A lot of the times, uh, rescue groups or, or uh, shelters, will you will call them and say, Hector, or you would call them and say, does this dog get along with kids? And they'll say, well, bring your kid with you. Hell no. If anybody tells you to bring your kid to find out if the dog likes kids or not, that is called child endangerment. They should know how to how, how to test the dog whether he likes kids or not if they don't know how to do that then they're in the wrong line of job because they're going to get sued for child endangerment they're going to get sued for liability don't let them set your kids up to fail all right most likely i probably need to see you uh karis going to class hopefully in november uh, i know it's still up i don't know i know i have a few openings so far uh chris uh sarah thanks for watching uh, Denise, New Hope Pet Rescue appreciates you and your dedication to your help. Yes, m uh, misunderstood rescue pups, correct. Now, there, Denise, I don't remember where Denise is from, but she messaged me and I got to message her back. Um, I am trying to get a class. Um, Den uh, I'm trying to get a, oh, you are Denise. Hello, Denise. Um, I'm trying to get a class for you. I'm just trying to find time. I think it's honorable that you want to get a class going for the dogs that just got adopted and rescued. You don't want them return. You don't want the people to get set up to fail. So just give me some time, Denise. I have a lot on my plate and I'm, I'm chewing very slowly so I don't burn myself out. Okay. Um, she was passed hair up. Okay. All right, Kimberly, then you need to come and see me to get this dog submissive and evaluated to see if it's good around kids. Okay. Uh, King coasters are predisposed to handle stress with aggression. So it, it is imperative that we don't set your kids up to fail. My number one advice right now is don't have it around kids, but play, get it to play with a ball, get it to attack a ball constantly so it can care less about kids. It's going to be stimulated um, instinct wise to go after an object. Very important. Uh, New Hope Pet Rescue, Michigan. Yes. Thank you, Denise. Uh, give me some time. Um, I, I, really, at the time that you messaged me this morning, I got about 20 messages at that same time. And I just have to screen real quick the important ones. Um, I know there was one where the dog actually bit bit the husband. I had to really re quick respond to him and just tell him how to manage the dog and uh, and to contact his uh, animal shelter to to secure the dog. That was in another state. But uh, but anyways, that that's that's what I did. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to look for another question. Um, I had a great one on one yesterday with a family uh, and their dog. Uh, Chandler and uh, and Morgan Barr, great, great, great dog. Uh, man, you talk about having a good time in training. I, I, I feel bad even charging people sometimes. We laugh so much, and yet we still train the dog. Uh, so it, it's nice to have a good time. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Lisa, yes, uh, what a great idea. I thought that was a great idea too, Lisa, to, to get a class going. On, on, on just rescue dogs that just coming in or or um, or just getting adopted from from a homeowner. Uh, thank you, Denise, for understanding. So September 30th, September 30th, I'm going to be talking about breeds and disposition. All right. Each breed is trained. It has a different body style and a different purpose in life um, so that we need to we need to adjust our training accordingly. I'm not going to train a miniature poodle the same way I'm going to train a German Shepherd. I'm not going to train a Rottweiler the same way I'm going to train a lab. Now you say why? Because I'm going to know that labs have better nerves than Rottweilers. I'm going to know that Golden Retrievers have better nerves than Shepherds. So I can train differently according to that. Okay. And, and some of these dogs, they don't even have a pain tolerance. Jesus, you could, as a man, you could lose yourself as far as with anger. And, and, and I don't want to do that. So I, I teach people, this is what we need to do. And a lot of the times these owners are, are really frustrated with their dogs because nothing works. Nothing works. Um, many times, I, there's many times people come to me with treats and they're like, well, Hector, I thought you were going to train with treats. I said, wait a minute, you're here. 
Your dog's three years old. For two years, you've been training with treats, and you want me to do the same thing that you've been doing? You want me just to take your money? No. No. If it's not working, let's change it. Let's change it. Now, I'm saying we, go to, we don't go to the shot collar. I just change it, okay? Kelly, uh, my beagle doesn't use her voice when she needs to go outside. She sits by the door, so sometimes we miss her cues. Any suggestions? Um, yes, Kelly. Good question, Kelly. Uh, for one, thanks for watching. And two, um, what you could do is you could do two things. You could put bells at your front door. So when you when she sits at the door, walk up to it. Just take her paw, hit hit, hit the paw with her bell, and then open the door. Through time, the dog is going to learn that if they hits the bell, the door is open. Okay. Second thing you can do. You could have somebody on the other side of the door when a dog doesn't have to go to the bathroom, go to the other side of the door and tease the dog. You want to go outside? You want to go outside? Get this dog happy. As soon as it gets happy and maybe barking, open the door, have somebody on the other side, give it a treat. Okay? So that way you excite the dog to create an indication to want to go outside. And then that will carry over when it wants to go outside. Now, the caveat to that, Kelly, the caveat is the dog may manipulate you to go outside when it wants but that's okay you can work through that you can find a happy medium with that i hope that helps uh th hey kurt thanks for watching i hope that helps jim thanks for watching i really appreciate it uh let's see if i have anybody else that uh sabrina thinks uh, I thought the same thing with my chocolate lab. I thought it felt no pain. Karis, I'm telling you, and, and he, do you know why they don't feel pain, Karis? I'll tell you that real, real quick. I got We got a few minutes here. They don't feel pain because they're bred with very good nerves. And I'll mention this next week. And I'll have time next week for problems, for uh, questions too. They, they don't feel pain because they're bred to take a muzzle blast to the ear. Golden Retrievers, Weinlanders, Labs, Springer Spaniels, all of those dogs are bred to take a muzzle blast to the ear. Through genetics, through breeding, they bred these dogs. They have very good nerves. Nothing bothers them. Now, do you get some dogs that are noise sensitive, that are Labs? Yeah, of course you do. And there's a reason. The reason why is because we don't have selective breeding in the United States. We just breed them all. We keep them all. All right. Uh, so we don't really selectively breed the dogs right now. So we, you could get a bunch of dogs that, that are very noise sensitive, that are labs, but in other countries or with reputable breeders, they don't breed that anymore. So that's why they have very good nerves, uh, very good nerves. They don't feel pain. And, and some of these dogs, you know, Karis, the, these people are at their wits end. I, I had a guy last year who said, Hector, I kicked my dog. I don't know how many times he could care less. He comes back for more. How in the hell are you going to get this dog submissive? And then I get some people with pit bulls that bring them with me with two shot collars on. And they're like, what the hell? How are you going to teach this dog to come, Hector? Two shot collars don't work. You know, and around the dog and the pit bull's neck, of course, they're not going to feel pain. They just tighten up. Their muscles absorb all that shock. They don't care. They fight it. In a lab or a golden retriever, may not even feel it. All right? So so that, that's why. Uh, Chad and Stacey, we use bells with our 10-week-old puppy. He's doing great in a few accidents. That's very good, uh, Chad. Start with those bells and then work your way into maybe just a bark or just, you can be married to that. That's okay, to the bells. Me, I don't let my dogs indicate. I routinely will take my dogs out even if they don't want to go out. Um, however, I have that time. I have that luxury because I'm home a lot with my dogs. Um, and then I take them to training. Uh, but even when I'm, when I'm gone on, uh, on my uh, public speaking trips, you know, the, the person coming in, they're just used to, oh, somebody's coming in, they're gonna let, them, let me out. They're not, they're not used to going in. Best way to, to get my rat to listen before we get him in. He usually is pretty good, just loses himself sometimes. Oh, it looks at us like we're stupid sometimes. Well, in, 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 Megan, in some cases, your dog may un not understand the concept. Um, so kind of maybe long leash until he understands or maybe long leash until he does my off leash class where he's got to come to you when you call him. All right. 
Um, but right now, staying aside of air, maybe long leash, reel them in. And there's nothing wrong with using the barter system right now with the treat. All right. Remember, off leash teaches them right or wrong. It, it also teaches them, you know, impulse control. Okay. So very important. Uh, Karis, in emo he's emotionally sensitive. Thanks to you. <laughs> we now to decompress him. Yes. Got to decompress him. Um, Karis, extremely important. Uh, let me read some other questions I have here. Uh, do, do, do here. You guys, Andrew, thanks for watching. I haven't seen you in a while, my friend. I hope your wife and you are really well. Uh, so listen, next next month then, listen here. Next month, uh, excuse me, next week, uh, over my head. Next week, we're going to talk about breed and talk about um, disposition. Disposition is what makes the dog temperament, how they listen. All that stuff comes into play. Their body that's disposition, right? For example, you don't want a golden retriever to jump and turn because they're, they're apt to tear their ACL. Disposition is German Shepherds uh, like to use their nose more. German Shepherds are predisposed to be aggressive. Okay, that's temperament. That's part of their disposition. One of the most frustrating things I get is when trainers, they, they will downplay a shepherd because he's aggressive. What the hell they're supposed to be? He's supposed to be aggressive. Why do you think he's, why do you say he's dangerous when he's supposed to be what he's designed to do? We just need to teach him what right or wrong and need to teach him that the owner is not weak. So how do you do that? Definitely not with force. So that's very important. Uh, Tanya, I want to take your off leash class. Tanya, a lot of that time uh, off leash class, we can do that on a one on one. I know we did a one on one already. But what I would probably do is go outside more in the field, over to the field and do and do off leash training. Maybe set up a few scenarios to uh, to test your dog's impulse control. In some cases, I do the uh, off leash uh, with a shot collar situational. But then uh, the owners will see that what stress has caused just that situation. So I teach them how to massage and relax the dog so that stress doesn't build. That stress doesn't build and then explode later on. Okay, and then explode later on. You're welcome, Megan. I appreciate your question. A lot of these times, people, when you ask me a question and somebody listens to my replay, it could pertain to them. So the ripple effect of your question, it, it, can, it can go more than just, just with you. So I, I appreciate your questions. Uh, tagline, control your dog at the door. Uh, manage your dog. Remember, police, utility workers, letter carriers, those are just a few people who can come on your property without your permission. Um, I train those to not use force, but in the event that they do, I also have to train them to do it, okay? So it's very important that you manage and control your dog. Your dog can be used for you and it can also be used against you if you don't manage them correctly, all right? I, I, look, forward, I look forward in the next few months of, uh, of going over how to train your dog, sit, to stay, different methods of training. You'll see uh, how I use treats with puppies. You'll see how I use treats with even older dogs who are confused. Um, you'll see how I don't use treats, how I just do follow through. You'll see how I do impulse control. You'll see how I teach the dog not to pull. Um, um, and I know I'm going to get, I know I'm going to get message from trainers. What the hell are you doing, Hector, teaching people how to how to do this? It's going to take our job away. No, it's not. What it's going to do is make your job better. Now I'm going to set the bar up a little higher so you have to teach better. So you have to do you have to work on these more difficult dogs. All right. So let me uh, make sure I don't have any questions. Lisa Bowles, thanks for watching. BB, BB, go back to my replay and watch the rest of the video. I'm glad you got a chance to watch, BB. We go back a long way with your aunt, okay? Uh, so thanks for watching, BB. I think I was supposed to do a talk for, for, for the county that you work for on how to deal with difficult people. And then the uh, pandemic hit. I was scheduled to do a talk for you guys. Um, and, or it was either difficult people or culture diversity. Uh, right now, nationwide, I'm getting a lot, of, a lot of referrals for culture diversity. I teach an excellent culture diversity. I say excellent. Uh, because I have a lot of fun doing it. I don't, I don't go into politics. I go into the real culture diversity issues. Uh, so anyways, uh, so thanks for watching. Lisa Bowles, thanks.
Uh, Andrew, again, uh, tell your wife I said hi. So any other questions, you guys? If not, listen, next week, the 30th, same time, same time, next week, the 30th, breed and disposition. Come with your questions because I'm going to try to answer them at the end. If I don't know it, I guarantee you I'll find the answer for it. Uh, over, uh, what, 34 years of dog training? I, I'm, I know a lot, but I just, I don't know everything. I made a lot of mistakes and I'm working through those. So any other questions? If you don't have any questions, we will see you next week at noon, at noon. And if you do, send me an email, send me a message, send me something to let me know that, that, uh, that you have a question.